Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. So this is a panel, one of the many panels you have been through with the past three days. I apologize for the Did glut. You say it was the best one? Uh, I said one of many, oh. but it will be the best. <laughs> so we're here to talk about corporate strategies for investing in open source sustainably, and what that means. Um, it's a really interesting question because obviously investing in open source is very, very easy to do if you have a really nice like process within your company to do that. But actually making sure that the investments you do make sense for the community and make sense in the long term is really difficult. And so we have a few panelists here to talk about what it means for their companies. Um, just so you have some context, I'm Richard Litauer. I work for Open Source Collective. Open Source Collective is a fiscal host that manages the money for 3,500 different open source projects. Um, we're kind of the equivalent of GitHub sponsors, except GitHub sponsors is mainly for individuals, open source collective is for collectives. Um, I also run the Sustain podcast. Um, there's a Sustain community dedicated towards understanding these questions. Alyssa is also a co-host on that podcast. Um, so that's my perspective. And then we have Alyssa Wright. Alyssa, do you want to talk about what you do at Bloomberg and how you got there? 30 seconds to one minute. Sure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Really pleasure to see everyone. Um, I am Alyssa Wright. Um, I currently help lead the um, OSPO um, team at Bloomberg Finance. Um, my journey there, um, where to start, right? But the journey started uh, with a, a deep interest in um, kind of like how we um, as humans like sort of relate to our digital and, and media environments. Um, that led to kind of a growing interest in open source. Uh, specifically, I was very much involved in um, open source geospatial technologies and have, have worked um, closely in the OpenStreetMap um, uh, software projects um, and uh, startups that have like um, you know grown from there. Um, about a year and a half ago, I joined um, the Bloomberg, Bloomberg's OSPO team um, with Kevin Fleming, if you've ever crossed paths with him. Um, a good deal of Bloomberg's um, technology uh, work is built on top of you know hundreds of open source um, projects and so um, it is a priority of the the space to have clear um, repeatable scalable processes policies you know support um, systems to uh, both sustain open source within the, the company um, and to sustain like the open source like projects that were um, you know uh, reaching uh, improving and relying upon um, beyond so much, Alyssa. So Bloomberg's a Fortune 500 company. Stripe is a bit of a newer player to the field. Um, so are you, Mike. So you want to talk about how you got there and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Fix. I am a software engineer at Stripe, uh, the fintech company most known for our internet payments products. Uh, so yeah, my foray into open source was first off as a maintainer. At near the end of college, I found this wacky world. I uh, got super excited about it. Um, and really jumped in as a maintainer, creating uh, an open source application called Carbon. It's a little app uh, to create and share screenshots of your code on Twitter and your blog posts and your presentations, et cetera. Um, and that grew enough where I got um, to really collaborate with the community and really found the joys of open source there. Um, it gave me like some deep, uh, I think, empathy um, for the space. Um, so then after a few years of doing that, I joined Stripe as an engineer um, and within a couple months of Joined the company, ended up in the open source working group, um, and then taking it over a month after that. Um, so I've been leading that uh, working group for the last couple of years, and for the last nine-ish months, I've uh, been doing open source full time as the head of their OSPO, head of open source, um, prioritizing open source strategy, trying to figure out the highest value ways we can use and contribute to open source to help the community and help our company. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mike. And now we have Suzanne from VMware, which is the more traditional tech company at this space. Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming after lunch and still being awake after lunch. So we're going to do our best to keep you awake. Suzanne Ambiel from VMware. I've been at VMware for 12 hmm, plus or minus years now. So I'm kind of a long-term um, long hauler at VMware. I got involved in VMware's OSPO about six years ago when our OSPO was first conceived. VMware has done open source for many, many years, uh, but six years ago they decided to form a more uh, strategic body called our OSPO to help us do more open source 
more consistently, uh, more sustainably, you can scale, um, and, and the company has grown so fast that having an OSPO really helps people move more quickly in open source because they know where the, the edges are. I think we were talking about lunch, and one of the, my fellow panelists there says, oh, that's like the bumpers in, in bowling, right? You've got the bumpers on the side, so you know when, you know, how to stay on the straight and narrow. So I work at, alongside our OSPO, and I also sit in VMware's brand and advertising team. So I split my roles. Uh, it's a very interesting world for me. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of context switching. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, you were the one of the first people who was interested in having this panel, um, largely because we were having a conversation about how you fund your open source ecosystem. So we're talking about sustainable methods of investing, and you don't just fund your dependencies, you don't just fund people who use Stripe, but you have a different strategy. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So coming from being a maintainer myself, I was always interested in how can you get paid doing the job, doing the thing you love, and eventually establishing open source maintainer as a viable career path. Uh, and really passionate about that in general. And so when I joined Stripe, uh, I was really interested in figuring out how we could contribute to that in general. So I wanted to start uh, an open source sponsorship program uh, to pay whichever open source maintainers we could. Um, but that led on the path of figuring out how we could do it the most sustainably. Um, uh, and what that meant was focusing on ROI, so return on investment for the company, figuring out how we could measure and determine that we're actually getting measurable returns for our company uh, in response to our sponsor program. So what ended up happening was we took a uh, user's first approach. We ended up sponsoring projects that our users use to integrate with Stripe. Um, and so by taking that approach, we can measure we can measure the money that we get back from those companies using our software because we're a SaaS business. Um, and because we can measure that, we can really sustainably uh, invest in that open source ecosystem. So instead of just contributing uh, on a quarterly basis or one-time grant or that sort of thing. So long as those projects are continuing to make us money, we're continuing to sponsor those maintainers. And just like you've seen in other business models, if you have reoccurring revenue, you can make different decisions as a maintainer. So these, these open source maintainers can basically rely on $3,000 coming to them every month. Um, and that's not a full-time job by any means, um, but we've seen so far that it is it does make a difference. And that, that dollar amount was intentionally chosen so it did uh, meet that threshold where they could rely on it, make different decisions in their life, and so far we've become like the number one client for folks that are like freelancers at their business, um, or it's been like a number one income stream for people that have small businesses while maintaining these open source projects. Thanks. So you mentioned um, a FOSS fund. So Alyssa, you previously worked uh, on a, another FOSS fund with JHU, you also helped with managing the digital infrastructure group, which is interested. It's a group of researchers trying to figure out what digital infrastructure means and how do we sustainably understand how we fund the world using open source. What I'm curious about is, do you, have you had the same experiences as Mike of having a FOSS fund and realizing it's not enough? And how has that influenced your policy at Bloomberg in sustainably giving back? Well, first, I, I think we need to do a audience call out to the original author of the Contributor FOSS Fund uh, sitting in the back. Um, many thanks to Indeed um, and, du and Dwayne O'Brien and all the work that um, came came together to put together this kind of like kind of an ind industry framework for a FOSS um, Contributor Fund. And I think, you know, generally in my sort of kind of reading of what that means is that, you know, how does a company organize a sort of uh, inclusive, repeatable voting mechanism to um, raise uh, certain um, open source projects, um, you know, raise as in like vote for certain open source projects, and those uh, quote winning projects um, would be uh, awarded a certain amount of money that was, that the company is like, you know, set aside to allocate to, to such, um, um, to, to such, uh, you know, rewards. And um, it requires a lot of, um, for, to implement, it requires a lot of um, administrative um, uh, pieces to come together as well as like cultural and, and distribution and, and, and language, you know, requirements. But I think one of the most positive things is that there's a collective conversation that happens like within the new organization at many different levels, everything from like um, what is a technologist to what are the tooling that we use to 
um, collect those votes to how do we make it repeatable to how does procurement like you know feel about all this um, uh, you have to like kind of shift the conversation in order to be able to support um, open source um, projects that maybe are not at the um, kind of at the uh, the have this the the same sort of I don't know sponsorship tier intake process that we might be useful used to with larger with larger open source projects because there are many so many different scales of open source projects. There's a long explanation, but I really encourage everybody to learn more about the uh, FOSS Contributor Fund in part because I think in, within the industry it's kind of changing some of the ways, some of the tools that we have at, on, on hand in order to make a difference and to make a difference um, to many different types of open source projects. Um, so all that said, what was the question? <laughs> how has working with FOSS Contributor Funds influenced your perspective on how you hold those conversations well within the company? Well, I think for me, so we have um, the go ahead at Bloomberg to move forward with the FOSS Contributor Fund. Um, uh, we, it's been a year go ahead to move forward with the FOSS Contributor Fund, and we've spent a lot of that year kind of um, bridging language between how we traditionally like evaluate um, a, a software vendor um, and the sta related statement of work. And so this has really been a, like a, a interesting exercise in um, translation. Um, and in order to like have like the signatures in place so that we can you know make something um, uh, make something come to be because we, we know that it's possible like within the context of Bloomberg because it is impossible within the context of almost any organization that's using um, open source open source software and they want to support open source software like again in a sustainable repeatable way um, I think I, I also want to emphasize that what we haven't touched upon yet is the really I think, interesting aspects for creating um, community, like internal in technology, momentum and engagement and dialogue. Um, there, are, you know, we kind of all get, can get siloed in our own work, but being able to talk across teams about what are the projects that are most useful for uh, your work, I think opens up like really interesting, exciting, and you know, related to retention um, conversations. Uh, talk, when you get to talk about open source, it crosses many bridges. Um, but it is not the only one, and and I don't think anybody here who's doing like um, a FOSS contributor fund would say that that's the end of the, the story. But I think it is a sometimes a culmination of like you know one one story, and I think um, can help us continue to redefine the needs around cultural um, and language like w ways of. Of being so that we can collaborate better, but I think that there are many other things, um, including better documentation and support and more nuanced like mentorship that are um, corporate strategies that I think that we are all pursuing um, that need to kind of move, need to move maybe a, a little bit more quietly, but need to move like in parallel to um, something um, as. As, as kind of revolutionary as a possible for your fund. Thank you. Um, Suzanne, so you don't even sit in the OSPO at your organization, which is really interesting because you also have to have these conversations, but I, I don't even know how you wear that hat at all. So well, I'm it's curious. multiple hats. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do they look like? What color are they? And how do you wear them? You know, I just have to make sure I've got the right hat on in the right room with the right people because it can be very confusing. Um, so at, at VMware, we are a large, large company. Uh, how many of you are familiar with VMware? Right. Um, we're 40,000 people strong now. It's, so it is, it is a sprawl. And, and we know and we recognize that open source can come from anywhere in that 40,000 employee ranks. Right? It doesn't just come from the OSPO. We're the, the guides. I think it was in an earlier panel where we talked about guides. We're the guides for the rest of the company. Um, and so when we look at open source and investing, right, and making it sustainable and scalable for a company of our size and complexity, you know, money is probably the worst possible choice we could make when it comes to the word investing. We have to think about investing quite differently. And we invest time and talent, not what I call our treasure. 
because to, to hand the money directly to a maintainer would be nigh impossible for, for a company like Myanmar because we have so many controls and constraints because of who we are and what we do, right? We build software that we sell for a profit. Let's be very clear about that, and we're proud of that, but we also coexist in, a, in an open source community as well. So our investments are leaning in on our talent and investing in projects via our people, and contributions, our leadership, um, via our work with the to-do group, Don Foster's here, and Chaos, um, Linux Foundation, all manner of things in that way where we're leaning in with our expertise um, and our know-how and our people's time, not our dollars per se. And we also look at investment from an, uh, our customer's perspective. VMware sells to the Fortune 1000. Now, the Fortune 1000 companies, not all of them have the wherewithal to participate in the open source community. They know it's critical to them. They know it's important, but they make sneakers. They're not good at this. So they look to VMware to be their proxy to represent their interests in the communities that they're interested in. So we oftentimes become their proxy and, and help them bring them along in the community. Um, and so I think you have to look at investing a little bit different. Don't get too pigeonholed, and the only way to invest in a project is to give it money. There are many ways to invest in a project that aren't just cash. Richard, what, what, what's your perspective on the Open Collective? From Open Source Collective? Yeah, yeah. Uh, invest all the time, invest all the money you can. Money, um, money, money. Well, no. So, <laughs> I'm in a weird position where I'm not corporate in the same way. I'm a 501c6 foundation and I'm here to help out those projects. Um, money is like the least important part of making a project sustainable. Um, docs are important. Governance is super important. Trying to figure out how to actually deal with the money once you have it. Trying to feel it, figure out who's in charge of this project, who are the maintainers there, how do they figure out where the money is going to be allocated, how do they figure out things like code of conduct when a maintainer burns out or when new contributors don't come back or when everyone just gets tired or when other people have shifting priorities. These are the questions I think about, which is a very different like approach from a corporate perspective. I have no idea how to do that effectively, which is why I brought you three up and I'm moderating. So I'm just going to pass the buck back. Um, oh, well, well played. Mike, would you like to dive back in there? <laughs> Can you tell a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So the conversation we had this week has been really interesting because uh, it's been all sorts of things around giving money or giving money to enhance something else or providing education or providing uh, leadership in a different way. Uh, but what we've been finding common ground on is the fact that uh, open source programs uh, and the strategies they provide like have to be intentional around corporate strategy. So like finding the initiatives, uh, the programs you can run, the ways you can invest that align well with your company's mission ends up creating like much more sustainable paths for us, that meant uh, contributing to our users' um, uh, integration guides because that meant that we didn't have to argue uh, our value every month. Uh, it became really obvious, uh, and that made our uh, program a lot more sustainable. Uh, we really haven't had to, you know, defend defend it with, um, yeah, defend to our CEO or CTO uh, since its inception. Um, and yeah, for for VMware and talking with Suzanne this last week, uh, that means different things uh, yeah. for you all. Um, it, in, intention is really important when you when you step into open source that you know why you are in that project or in that community and if you work for a company I do most people here do understanding how that work lines up to the corporate strategy make sure your intentions line up they're not going to be one for one right but they have to be aligned and if you're working in open source and you're working for a small company or a large company in finance or in tech, if you check yourself every now and again and find too much daylight between what you're doing and why you're doing it and the corporate strategy, you need to stop for a minute and ask yourself, how did the drift happen? Is, is this amount of drift okay or will this cause problems? Right? You always have to be able to ladder up. When you can't ladder up anymore, that's when you should stop and have a check. We all know that corporate strategies change and drift. They just do because they are, you know, dynamic bodies of work. And we all know that open source drifts. It doesn't stand still. It can't. Otherwise, it wouldn't survive. 
So all this is moving at different paces and for different reasons. So it's always important when you're investing the way we do in open source is to check in. Are our strategies still aligned? Yes, no. If no, is it close enough? Or is it so far apart that we need to realign? So it's really important. And even when you're doing money, I think it's important too to check in. Strategy's still good? Great, keep going. Thoughts? Well, first on that very last point, I, I'd love to see, especially since we, like, we are, are working with shared resources, what those questions are that kind of check yourselves. I think it would be nice to have um, kind of a consistency across our work to be like, are we drifting, are we aligned? But, but, but all that to also say, um, I feel like this is, um, reminds me of the importance of partnerships um, and people that can help bridge um, the language, um, the requirements, the, the, the ways of, of talking um, in order to have um, open source, um, you know, a, as a movement of body, of body movement and, you know, corporate strategies as a, as a uh, body of movement to have you need, you need your your partners um, to help you find like spaces of bridging and alignment and so I think that's a lot of the work that we do I imagine as all of us in the Aspo like space um, is finding like those partners to help us continue to translate and to some extent um, now I do tell me well I already have my like, I'm good so, okay so um, <laughs> every open source community that you're working with is your partner. And so trying to figure out what their needs are and what their goals are is really, really important. And this is really freaking hard. Um, as you all know, especially to go down the dependency stack, the further you go, the harder it is. And there are some tools right now to figure out what your dependency stack is and how to think about it. Um, ecosystems, ecosystem.ms is one of the main ones that's made by the same person who made libraries.io, which is really, really cool, which now Tidelift uses to figure out their dependency tracking. Um, that's useful for saying, what are we using? Also, the so guy I work with, yeah, my boss, yeah. Ben, yeah, he's great. Um, but that's a really good tool for figuring out what am I working with and how it's going to work, but then figuring out which are the main nodes in that tree and what are their strategies and what are their needs and what are their goals and are they being funded adequately is part of your job as being in an OSPO. Um, and that's tough to do and takes a lot of work. So if you figure out how to make it faster, please let me know. Um, which actually reminds me that we could talk all day. Could I repeat the what? Site. Yeah, ecosystem.ms. Ecosystem. Yeah, ecosystems. Yeah. Um, and there's a few other interesting ones that are coming out now. Um, but that that's the main one that's going to be happening. It's currently being worked on really hard by Andrew. Um, it's going to come out in the next month or two, I believe, with more stuff that you can use in your OSPO. Can we throw, like, tidbits down, like, in two seconds and then open it up to... If you have a tidbit, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I have a tidbit. Yeah, go ahead. But one, one thing that I've been chewing on, uh, so Bloomberg Finance is it's in a really interesting and unique position in the industry in that all of our profits go towards the Bloomberg Philanthropies. And so we've made, you know, incredible investments um, in, and, and I think difference in everything from climate change to urban development. And so it, it is um, of interest to me um, sitting in on the, in the OSPO team to, like, draw stronger relationships with like philanthropic um, um, efforts and so what what can I do there you know how can I leverage what's unique about you know where I sit um, at, at Bloom, at being in Bloomberg which was another com company um, with something that's really like quite powerful um, you know in making a difference in, in, the, in the world and the sustainability of like a larger uh, world yeah so that's one of my tidbits, and if anybody ever wants to talk about that, please come to me. It's really like these are these are seedlings. My tidbits can be very different, but uh, something that I keep pondering on uh, is around the money and investment, and how uh, it doesn't it's not the only thing by any means. But what I found from sitting in my role at Dospo is that it really makes the conversation simpler in two different ways. So internally, when you're pitching upwards or pitching laterally. Uh, it just flattens the conversation. Your boss says, how much money do you, do you need? How much money is it returning you? All right, the conversation's pretty much over um, if you can pitch that well. And we're in a very fortunate position that we can, given like just the nature of our business being a SaaS model. So it, doesn't, it wouldn't work that easily for everyone. Um, and so what that gives us is that 
uh, we tell the ROI to our boss, but then as teammates, as people that run the hospital together, uh, we get to celebrate all the wins of our community, all the little things that they've released, the feature improvements um, as, as a community and like celebrate those together. So for example, uh, we pay some money to this maintainer who created the use Stripe. Um, and so he's, he, can, he maintains that he creates features from them, but at the same time, um, that little urge of the 3K a month or whatever sort of inspired him to take the next step and he started open source Philippines. So now he's like developed this whole, whole ecosystem of um, open source. And so we actually ended up just sponsoring open source Philippines uh, instead of him as maintainer. So now that's a, an, like a collective that he's um, now running. And so that's, that's the other side of the equation where the money didn't wasn't the only thing for him, but it acted as a catalyst for other change. Um, and now he's you know bringing on community partners, bringing on Microsoft, uh, open source, and the Philippines, um, and having all these other uh, changes spiral out of that. So, yeah. Okay, um, two bits. Um, this one's for you, Richard. Uh, fault lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. Uh, Was it Shakespeare? Uh, yes, that's. Okay. Courtesy of Bill, you're welcome. Um, uh, you know, and the meaning behind that is is, is a, about intentionality and knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it and having those conversations all the time. Don't get disconnected from your community, but don't get disconnected from your corporate overlord, if you will, right? Who, who's paying you and making sure you're having those conversations. The OSPO at VMware helps those internal conversations happen to make sure there's good alignment. Again, I refer back to how large VMware is and how someone over here could be doing something in open source and over here, same, and over here in a proprietary fashion. And our OSPO helps to get that alignment, that intentionality um, squared up and making sure people understand where they're headed, right? So they don't get themselves backed into a corner in, unintentionally. So we act as advisors and guides and, and help people understand what investment looks like in, in open source. It can look like many things. And it's not just money, but it's a lot of different things. To this whole week, for instance, is an investment in open source for VMware. About 18 people here, we have a booth. This is an important place for us to be. So this is an investment as well. It's not a direct investment. It's not a $3,000 check every month. It's a different type of investment but uh, it, it aligns to VMware strategies. So I think that's important. So uh, there you have it, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, open it up for questions. We have one in the back already, and I'm gonna repeat it for the people on the broadcast. So go ahead. Um, how does risk management play into this? Because obviously we've all got big stacks, and we've all, you know, we all know the XKCD cartoon, right? Um, how can funding how do we measure the risk of our, of our software development uh, environment, uh, deployment environment, and how does funding fit into that? So the question was, how does risk management play into this thing? When your dependencies fail, how do you know where they are? How do you make sure it doesn't happen? How does that influence your corporate strategy for investing sustainably in open source? Um, to give it to Mike, because he looked the most perplexed. I'm excited, yeah. Uh, this was, I was thinking a lot about this uh, the other day, um, because as a small OSPO, we have to focus our attention on a very limited number of things. Uh, and you could take any number of directions, like uh, going marketing side, or the software side, or community side, or dev advocacy side. Um, and that ended up making me think that like in an ideal world, uh, in a software company, there is no OSPO. You just have a bunch of divisions that are all open source informed and understanding how they should leverage or contribute to the community to best advance uh, their goals. And so for Stripe, uh, managing risk is a job of all software engineers, but there's already like, there's tons of risk management organizations that are understand our dependency chain um, and have like better insight into that space than I, I would even. Uh, and they, they analyze it across all of our software stacks, so the open source dependencies, as well as internal stuff, as, as well as internal forks, all these sorts of spaces. So in that sense, the OSPO doesn't do too much, but we would encourage other teams to become more software informed and bring in those risk management pr principles to their expertise area. Uh, VMware's product portfolio is 
enormously complex and diverse across all kinds of technologies. So Rick's management, it's a little difficult to, to pin that down. Our OSPO provides guidelines, best practices. We provide guidelines on types of licenses, on how to create uh, what we call an OSL. Um, release management, we rely on our security team, we rely on our, our legal team for IP and trademark, um, pet patents. You know, it, it takes a village for risk management because risk management is a large field that could include any number of things. Um, so it, it does take a village um, when looking at open source and your dependencies and what are you using and why are you using it and, and all of that. Um, so it, it, it takes a lot of people with a lot of different expertise. It doesn't lie in one organization for VMware. And I see Dawn nodding her head up and down. She's quite aware of risk management. So if you have questions for Dawn afterwards, Dawn, raise your hand. Um, she could go on forever. So big, bring a big coffee because it won't be a short conversation. I, I want to agree with everything that's that's been said before, and um, uh, as a as a, I guess two things. One, I think it's important that the open source program office um, uh, is is present at the conversations around uh, risk risk assessment and management and the tools because um, uh, our what we are asked to be. Um, uh, you know, aware of, responsible for, um, you know, be leaders of, um, uh, is part of part of risk management. Management. So just being in the room, I think, is important um, for for successful, you know, for, for successful uh, ad addressing. And and I'll get just give one um, example of how some things have changed for us. So um, with the log for log for shell, um, you know, we're on a at the end of twenty twenty one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it became uh, it became a priority for us. Um, really generated from like the the people that were uh, addressing the issue internally to become a member of um, of the Eclipse Foundation and to support the Adoptium Network, uh, Adoptium Foundation, uh, which is fiscally hosted by Eclipse. Um, and and so. That's something that OSPO, like, you know, we heard, we, 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 we were able to hear that there was a risk in the, um, you know, in our entire ecosystem and that there were, like, efforts to, um, uh, you know, uh, address that um, prior prior to such, um, such uh, events. Um, and we, we looked to, you know, put our support um, both, like, in terms of, you know, uh, lead, Technical leadership, as well as like financial investment into like the the foundations and the, the projects that are already working towards towards such things. So, the thing I would say around OSPO is that it's not just the OSPO's job to fix the risk; it's the OSPO's job to communicate the risk internally yeah. mm. to everyone there. And just like you know, when the Queen died, they didn't have to write a new article for New York Times; they already had that written. They were just sitting on it. So I would start sitting on all the different things that might come up, and just be ready to explain that to the CEO. No, it's okay. This has happened for this reason. Yes, we're working on it in this way. And whatever you do, don't email the open source maintainer and demand a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, please, please don't do yeah. that. I, mean, I, I, I sometimes wonder where I spell fits into all that as well, right? Yes. And it's also, uh, especially now in the current climate, a lot more federal talks are happening. Um, and not just in the US, but in the EU. So listen to OFE, listen to the Atlantic Council. But um, I think, but listen also internally to where yeah. you all think there are risks. I'm seeing Dwayne with your hand up, unfortunately. I know, I'm scared, I'm scared of Dwayne, so. Yeah. Why are you so, I'm, okay. It's an act of love. What's up? Yeah. The to-do group survey from last year showed more than half of the companies that are thinking about starting an hospital are a thousand people or less, and like a third of them are under a hundred people. OSPOs are a great construct for large organizations, but the smaller you are, the harder it might be to prioritize the headcount for a dedicated person for that. So for the smaller companies who want to get involved in sustaining open source, either financially or time, what advice would you have? So the question, again, was um, Good question. the 2021 survey showed that a third of OSPOs that are going to be started are in companies of a thousand people or less. What are the strategies for smaller companies to deal with open source when they don't have the resources to dedicate an entire team or even an entire person to dealing with open source policy at their company? 
That is a very good question, which none of you are able to answer except Suzanne. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go. Why, why Suzanne? Uh, because her hand was up. Okay. <laughs> uh, kindergarten, you raise your hand, you get to talk next. That's how it works, I don't know. Um, um, so, yeah, I work for a huge company, but I think when you step down and look at smaller companies like Stripe, it, it goes back to, I think, a shared sort of um, experience where it takes a village once again. It doesn't take a full person, but a little bit of your time and a little bit of your time and your expertise and your expertise and have a council, have a, a some sort of club. I don't know, call it what you will of people who know certain parts about open source and can meet regularly and help to guide the company around those decisions. How do you justify some of that? Well, one of the justifications, I think it was that piece of research, Dwayne, or maybe a different one that shows that up to 80% of a code base of, of an application is reused. And within that is going to be open source code. And if you're not accounting for that, right, you're, you're, you have a blind eye to 80% of the code you're shipping, does that feel comfortable? It should scare you. You should pause and think, oh, is all of my budget of time and talent and people going to just the 20% I see? What about the rest? You would never invest that way. So I think you have to kind of reevaluate where you're at with the software that you're using and producing and really understand if, if you are correctly applying you know, your personnel investments. And, and do you have, back to your mention back there of risk management, do you have a risk issue because you're ignoring a huge chunk of the code that you are either using or relying on or shipping and packaging? Yeah, I'll just uh, add that a little bit because um, our OSPO formed out of a, a council just like you mentioned and I thought that was a great point. So it doesn't have to start with formalized headcount and in fact you probably need partnerships to start one anyways. Like you need dev advocacy, legal, engineering, uh, design brand like all these folks are, are involved uh, in, in the making of open source um, so that's how ours started and for in terms of turning it into a team with headcount um, the advice I got when I was transitioning to doing open source full-time was if you just start doing the work and you end up doing open source full-time and that is valuable to your company and you don't need to defend that value then you just get the headcount by default um, and so that's, that's what worked for us. And I guess I had good leadership that understood that. Uh, my boss's boss who st uh, approved the OSPO for us, um, she always says like, if you need to like argue your worth, like it's probably not, you're probably not doing the things that are valuable. Um, so yeah, just like keep trying to find the alignment uh, for your team. What I would say as well is something like 90% of current applications use open source. Um, and so you could also lean on inner source as being a way of justifying an OSPO and outer source thing. So talk to Claire and figure out how that works. Um, Claire, I'm not going to go with you, but to go with this guy. Question? Um, yeah, so I, I definitely resonate with that perspective where if you're having a conversation with any of the stakeholders in terms of getting money, um, it is very easy to have that conversation in an open, even in, with an open source project where you can show positive revenue or show positive return on investment. So my question is, have you ever been in a situation where you are dealing with a harder to demonstrate that return on investment or in a situation where the return on investment is clear, but there is a wide, um, it could be this, it could be that. Um, so there's just a wide band in terms of what that ROI is going to be. And then for those types of projects, I guess my question is, um, how did you measure it and how did those conversations go? So the question was, how do you deal with um, circumstances where ROI is either dubious or lossy and you're not really sure what's going on? How do you talk about that to your company? So I think, Mike, that was to you. It was, it was pretty much Mike. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Mike. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question, uh, particularly because some of the investments we make are for projects that are just getting started. They don't have users yet. They definitely don't have money yet. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And so we end up we end up basically treating the ROI of the program as a whole, not necessarily treating them as individual 
individual ROIs, but uh, is this collective investment returning to the company in the same way like a VC firm would, right? Like they need the one unicorn to return. The rest of them can all die. Um, we don't, we don't go, we don't like, we, so then we end up investing in those, uh, those uh, projects nonetheless, because they, <laughs> not, nonetheless, uh, we invest in them nonetheless um, to keep them running, yeah. And so some of the projects we've invested in more recently haven't been the ones that make us money, but are our dependencies. Uh, and the argument for in those investments have been different, whether it's uh, getting like an enterprise support contract by paying a, a monthly fee through GitHub sponsors, uh, or investing uh, in one of a, a new dependency that we want to take on, and we want to make sure, oh, is, if this, we're going to rely on this indefinitely. So um, for this particular case, um, those maintainers are asking for it in a sort of like joint licensing model. Um, so we've gone through it that approach, and so that's just like an instant ROI where we couldn't adopt that new dependency without it. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Claire, is that okay? Yeah. Um, it, it was in relation to uh, specifically when you were investing talent and time, and um, the survey this morning or this morning or whenever they released the survey results, we're talking about the fact that there are more and more people doing that in corporations, which is fantastic. But that the like carving out that time and time pressure seems to be one of the barriers to sustaining that effort. And so great that you know you VMware would, would like have that happen across the company. But I'm kind of curious as to tactics that enable individuals to continue to carve that time out and uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? So the question was, what do you do when giving time, talent, treasure, and then time actually is good, but it's not sustainable in the long run because that hurts your company's ROI in general, or hurts your company's paycheck? How do you deal with that? So it's, it goes back to you know intentionality and having those constant conversations with your management and your manager and your team. Because again, as we said earlier, projects drift, so do corporate strategies, so do product roadmaps, and having that, that conversation. In tech, time is always not enough. You're always scrambling, you're always behind. And so it's just a constant battle, whether you are in open source or not. And just having that conversation, we hear it all the time, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough time, I don't know. And so it's, it's I don't think it's any different than any other conversation you're gonna have with your manager. And you know, when you're working on a product, and I say that word specifically, something that you sell, and there's open source dependencies, that's where you have that conversation that says, well, the success of the product depends our, on our continued investment in the projects that comprise the product. And our, you're laughing at me, but uh, again, you have to be very explicit. The language changes in open source. And if you're working with product managers who are unaware of that, you really have to be intentional with your language too and have those constant conversations. And it's always going to be a problem. So, Richard. Sorry, my friends and co-mates in exile. We do have to wrap it up. But unfortunately, the best part of the conference is the coffee track. So do meet us over there if you want to talk further. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.